Welcome to the Secret Underground Laboratory Recovery and Salvage, where rude mechanicals do magic. Hello, I'm Bronze Age, Director of the Secret Underground Laboratory Recovery and Salvage. And today I'm finally going to do something I've put off long enough. I've had this plane so long, I don't remember where I found it. It was probably eBay, one of those lowball bids I made, and then the auction closes and me being the only bidder, probably $5. So with shipping, I can't have more than 15 bucks in it. I got it cheap because the tote is broken, and now it's time to make a new one. The tote fits into the dovetail slot on the front, and it's held on with a screw. I have a piece of ash that's a cut off from another job, it's the perfect size for this job. All I have to do is cut the dovetail and then shape it to be a comfortable handle. One reason I'm wanting to do this now after all these years is it be an opportunity to use a lot of the tools that only come out when I do woodworking demonstrations. That's the kind of thing where I haul the Sunrise Cypress chest out to a fair or a festival and people are more impressed by the shavings than whatever I'm making. This is my double tooth mortgage gauge. It's perfect for transferring the measurement from the old tote to the new piece. I like to use my Stanley knife to make layout irons. This knife is cast iron with a fixed blade. Stanley has made a lot of different box cutter style knives over the years. Mine has the original paint and it's modeled with the holes in the handle. Any shop will collect a lot of box cutters over time and I probably have a dozen or more modern ones which are safe to carry in your pocket but I keep this on the bench for work like this. This is my marking gauge with a knife blade cutter. I have another with a pen cutter. I use them whenever possible because like the Stanley knife, they leave a sharp line and if it's set correctly, transfers the exact measurement. It's a no-name tool, no marking of any kind, but it works as well as the one a cabinet maker used 200 years ago. This is the same procedure as cutting blind dovetails for a drawer front. The saw cuts the corners as far as it can and then it's all chisel work. I just realized I was still wearing my mask. I was called to the front to talk to customers earlier and I've gotten so used to wearing a mask I didn't notice until I needed to blow sawdust away from the line. When I move the block to the edge of the vise, I use my wedge jack to keep the face square. I use this jack more often on the drill press when I have to bore a hole in some irregularly shaped piece. I have another video on how I made the wedge jack. Chisels are like box cutters. You always have a collection of odd ones, but everybody needs a special set of chisels that are brought out for fine work. I bought this set from Garrett Wade about 30 years ago when I was about to start work on the Sunrise Cypress chest, and they have served very well. They take a good edge and they keep it even in the hardest wood. I wish I could say that for all my chisels. I have a 2 inch Buck Brothers chisel they call the professional chisel. I had to cut some really big mortises in a 4x4 yellow pine and I used that chisel to clean out the mortise. 
when I was done the edge looked like a hacksaw blade. The chisel work is finished and I have a nice smooth slip fit. There's no need for it to be any tighter, just no slack. It's going to be held with a screw. Now I have to mark out the grip. I looked at a lot of photographs of this style plane and I found the totes to be a little small for my liking. I want something closer to a hammer handle, something I can get a good grip on. I'll do the rough cut with my bow saw. After our great winter storm last year, there was plenty of oak on the ground and firewood was free for the taking. I got enough to keep my smoker going all summer. One piece looked nice after I split it, so I saved it to make this saw. I need to finish smoothing it, uh, but that's another project. The blade is salvaged from a broken bandsaw blade. I welded a tongue on each end uh, and it cuts better than it did when it was on the bandsaw. A job like this calls for creative clamping. I need to shave the corners round, so I use a pair of V-blocks to hold the piece at a 45 degree angle. Besides holding the toad at the right angle, the V-blocks help keep the vice face straight and make for a tighter hold. The grip on the toad is an inside curve, so my choice for this is my Stanley number 67 spoke shave with a round sole. This is what Stanley called their universal spoke shave. It originally came with either a round or a flat sole piece. I only have the round one. Stanley made this tool from 1897 to 1941. A lot of tools disappeared from the Stanley catalog after 1941. All American industry switched to wartime production and I suppose the army didn't have a great need for spoke shaves. I rounded off the lower front with an AMT concave or half round spoke shave. AMT was American Machine and Tool Company, not to be confused with the American Machine Tool Company. AMT is one of the many brand names exported to Asia, so tools with a familiar name could be imported to the United States. AMT gets a lot of flack about quality, but if I keep the iron sharp, this one does just fine for what I need. The final touches are made with a fine half round rasp, and then I clean the dust off the camera lens. After that, a little sanding smooths out any stray tool marks. I'm happy with the fit. It feels nice in my hand. Later, I'll give it a coat of boiled linseed oil after it sits a few days a coat of wax. Right now, I need to clear the bench and get back to the work that pays the bills. The last step is to fasten the tote in place with a screw and uh, this project will be finished. This design of plane goes back to the days of the Romans probably before because really all 
all it is is just a block of wood with a chisel clamp to it. That makes dating these things really difficult, especially if there's no uh, maker's name on it. And that was uh, very uncommon, very uncommon to mark one of these planes, basically because there were no patents, there were no trademarks involved in it. All you wanted to do was make it as quickly and cheaply as possible and sell it. This one is marked with a 10 here, a 10 here, a 10 here, and a 10 here. So I guess they wanted everybody to understand that it was a 10 inch plane, maybe. These apparently are the owner's marks, A, K, and what this is in the middle, I have no idea. But uh, if we take a little chalk, rub it on here and maybe this will show up for the camera I hope so take a good look at that you can actually see the layout marks these little angled lines here they indicate the angles for the uh, throat the only clue we get to the actual age of this is on the iron here and it says William Ash and Company warranted cast steel. Now, a little research, which brings up a lot of people saying they think, but they're not sure, is that William Ash and company operated from 1822 to 1845 or so, and this is when they used this particular logo. Um, that doesn't mean this plane goes back to 1820 to 1840. Possibly could, because uh, irons usually outlasted the plain body. Now this is a scrub plane which uh, is defined by this rounded iron here. And it's made for scooping out large amounts of wood at a time. A roughing plane. If you want to reduce the thickness of a board in a hurry before you put the smooth plane to it. a uh, rough scallop surface but it does get rid of a lot of wood in a hurry so this is Bronze Age director of the Secret Underground Laboratory thank you for watching this video and sticking with it this far and uh, we hope to see you in the next video don't forget to like and subscribe and uh, we'll be back real soon